Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to start a new series called Introduction to SQL brought to you by Datacamp. Let's get started. So if you're not familiar with SQL, SQL is an essential language for building and maintaining relational databases. And if we look at this course in specific, it looks like it's a two hour course, with seven videos and 24 exercises. So let's hit the green button to start the free course. The first exercise is a video, so we'll go ahead and click play here. Hello and welcome. My name is Izzy Weber and I will be your SQL coach. We have two main goals in this course. In chapter one, we will get to know databases, which store and organize data electronically. We'll discuss how databases and the data they store are structured. This context will prepare us for our second goal, to extract data from databases using SQL code in chapter two. Let's dive in. A database stores data. Let's imagine that we are in charge of storing and organizing data for a library. We might set up a database that holds information such as the data pictured here on patrons, books, and checkouts. This information is housed in objects called tables, with data organized into rows and columns. This database contains a patrons table, a books table, and a checkouts table. A closer look at the patrons table shows that it stores various data about our library's patrons like library card number, name, the year the patron became a library member, and the total overdue fines the patron owes our library. A relational database defines relationships between tables of data inside the database. For example, each of our library patrons might each be associated with several checkouts. Through these relationships, we can draw conclusions about data housed in separate tables in the same database and answer questions such as, which books did James check out during 2022? Or which books are checked out most often? These tables might look similar to the way data is organized in spreadsheet applications such as Excel or Google Sheets, but databases are far more powerful than spreadsheets. Databases can store much more data, and storage is more secure due to encryption. Possibly the biggest advantage of a database is that many users can write queries to gather insights from the data at the same time. When a database is queried, the data stored inside the database does not change. Rather, the database information is accessed and presented according to instructions in the query which leads us to the star of this show, SQL. SQL, or SQL, is short for Structured Query Language. It is the most widely used programming language for creating, querying, and updating relational databases. Once we are familiar with the data we have and which table it is stored on, we can use SQL to begin writing queries to answer questions about our library. More on that in chapter two. All right, let's flex this newfound database knowledge in some exercises. Data organization. If you'd like to use SQL to gain insights from data, understanding the organization of a database is an important first step. Take a look at the database below. Which of the following statements correctly describes its organization? A. This is a table containing three relational databases, employees, job levels, and apartments. This is a relational database containing three tables, employees, job levels, and departments. And this is a database, but it's not relational because no relationship exists between job levels and departments. And this is not a database because there's no SQL code shown. So this is a relational database that contains three different tables, the employees, job levels, and departments. So let's do B and submit answer. Looks like it was right. Continue. So for exercise two, we're gonna look at the database advantages. Imagine you are part of a discussion at work about whether or not to create a database. You've learned a lot about several advantages of storing data in databases rather than traditional formats like spreadsheets. If you can remember what they are. So how many people can use at once is an advantage. Can you easily see all the data at once is a disadvantage. You have to query it. Secured with encryption is definitely an advantage. Fast and easy setup. 
not much of an advantage there. Um, more storage is an advantage. So like we can submit our answer. We are right. Let's continue. We've come to our next video about tables. Let's click play. Now that we know the basic organization of a database, let's take a closer look at the main building block of databases, tables. We saw in the previous lesson that databases are organized into tables, which hold related data about a particular subject. As we've seen, tables are organized into rows and columns. In the world of databases, rows are often referred to as records and columns as fields. A table's fields are limited to those set when the database was created, but the number of rows is unlimited. Let's talk a little bit more about table naming. Table names should be lowercase and should not include spaces. We use underscores in place of spaces. And ideally, a table name would refer to a collective group like inventory, but it's also okay for the table to have a plural name such as products. A record is a row in a table. It holds data on an individual observation. Taking a look at the patrons table, we see that the table has four records, one for each of the patrons. The record for Yasmin indicates that she became a member in 2022 and owes $2.05 in fines. A field is a column in a table. It holds one piece of information about all observations in the table. The name field in the patrons table lists all of the names of our library patrons. Because field names must be typed out when querying a database with SQL, field naming is important. Generally, field names should be lowercase and should not involve spaces. A field name should be singular rather than plural because it refers to the information contained in that field for a single record. This is why our table has card num and name fields rather than card nums and names. Similarly, two fields in a table cannot have the same name. Finally, field names should never share a name with the table they are housed in so that it's clear in all cases whether a field or table is being referred to. A unique identifier, sometimes called a key, is just what it sounds like. A unique value which identifies a record so that it can be distinguished from other records in the same table. This value is very often a number. In the patrons table, it makes sense to use the card num field as the unique identifier for each patron, not the name field, because it's possible that as our little library grows, two patrons might have the same name. Having more tables, each with a clearly marked subject, is generally better than having fewer tables where information about multiple subjects is combined. Take a look at the patrons and checkouts tables. Now, here's what our patrons and checkouts tables would look like if we tried to combine them. It's the same data, but much less clear because it now contains duplicate information. While we can see that Izzy has two checkouts and Maham has none, the card num column is no longer unique because of Izzy's multiple checkouts. We can always use SQL to gather information from multiple related tables and connect them if a question requires it, but table topics should remain separate. Let's table this discussion so we can get started practicing. Picking a unique ID. You've learned that a unique identifier is a unique value that identifies a record so that it can be distinguished from other records in the same table. Let's take a closer look at the table. Which of the fields do you think is best suited for the unique identifier? Uh, probably the ID field. Let's find it here. Click it. Submit an answer. Continue. Setting the table and style. Imagine that you're designing a database and the following table has been suggested. Your task is to provide feedback on how this table could be improved. Use the skills you learned in the last video to critique it. So the field name should be capitalized. Let's say false. Let's keep it under case. The customer's field should be renamed. Um, false, it looks fine to me. The table should not be capitalized. Um, true. The table name should be named singular. False, because it's full of customers. 
underscores, and then field names should be replaced with spaces. False. The field names should be named singular true, because this is customer. Let's submit answer and see how we did. It looks like this one is wrong. The customer's field should be renamed true because we should make it singular. Looks good, submit answer. Continue. Our very own table. We've set up a database inside this course and the books table is available in the exercise. You'll use SQL to query this table in the next chapter, but for now, it's time to explore what data books holds. Your task is to choose the option below that best describes the information contained in books. There's no need to do any coding in this exercise. You can answer this question by looking at the books table in the console next to the word query results. Because some book titles are long, you may need to scroll to the right in order to see all the information that the book table contains. So we have our query results. Let's look at the books table. We have ID, title, author, year, and genre. If you look at our answers, books contain records for ID, title, etc. Um, books contain fields for ID. So I'm leaning towards this one right now. Um, books contain records for title, author, year, and genre. ID is a unique identifier, but not a record. So we're saying these are fields, not records anyway, so this doesn't apply. Um, books contain fields for title, author, year, genre, and ID is a unique identifier, but not a field. Um, it is a field here. It is also a unique identifier, but let's go with this second one. Submit answer, and it looks like that's correct. Continue. Welcome to the final part of the databases chapter. This lesson will focus on the data inside a database as well as its storage. When a table is created, a data type must be indicated for each field. The data type is chosen based on the type of data that the field will hold, a number, text, or a date, for example. We use data types for several reasons. First, different types of data are stored differently and take up different amounts of storage space. Second, some operations only apply to certain data types. It makes sense to multiply a number by another number, but it does not make sense to multiply text by other text, for example. In programming, a string refers to a sequence of characters such as letters or punctuation. On the patrons table, the data in the names field is made up of strings, such as Maham and James. SQL has several different data types that can hold strings. Some string data types can only hold short strings, such as a string up to 250 characters. Storing short strings in a small data type like this saves storage space. SQL's varchar data type is more flexible and can store small or large strings, up to tens of thousands of characters. Because of its flexibility, varchar is very commonly used for storing strings. Integer data types store whole numbers, such as the years in the member year column of the patrons table. Just as with strings, SQL offers a few different data types for storing integers, depending on how big the numbers we'd like to store are. Int, a common SQL integer data type, can store numbers from less than negative 2 billion to more than positive 2 billion. Float data types store numbers that include a fractional part, such as the $2.05 that one patron, Yasmin, owes in fines. Just as we might expect, SQL also offers several float data types depending on how many digits the numbers in the field are expected to be. The numeric data type can store floats which have up to 38 digits total, including those before and after the decimal point. Now that we're familiar with data types, we can look at a database schema. Schemas are often referred to as blueprints of databases. A schema shows a database's design, such as what tables are included in the database and any relationships between its tables. A schema also lets the reader know what data type each field can hold. The schema for our library database shows the varchar data type is used for strings like book title, author, and genre. We can also see that the patrons table is related to the checkouts table, but not the books table. Finally, 
Let's discuss storage. The information we find in a database table is physically stored on the hard disk of a server. Servers are centralized computers that perform services via requests made over a network. In our case, the service performed is data access, but servers are also used to access websites or files stored on a server. Any computer can be a server if it is set up to provide a service, even a laptop. However, servers are generally very powerful and large machines because they are best equipped to handle a high volume of requests and data. Okay, let's get some practice with data. At your service, now that we know more about how data is stored, it's time to test those skills. Select the statements about the database that is false. So servers can be used for storing website information as well as databases, true. Server can handle a request from many computers at once, true. Servers are usually personal computers such as laptops, false. I'm gonna say false here, let's read the last one though. Data from databases is physically stored on the server, that's true. So we'll go three, submit answer, correct. Finding data types. Imagine that you're starting a new job and have just started getting to know your new employer's database. You know it's important to know the data types such as varchar, integer, numeric, corresponding to each table, each field in the table. Where can you find this information? So I'm gonna go with schema, so let's read the answers and see if we can see anything with a schema. Um, you find this information by looking at each table in the database. Um, you find this information by looking at a diagram of relationships between tables. It sounds like a schema, but let's continue. Um, you can find this information by looking at the values in each field for the table. Possible, but very tedious, and you could get it wrong. Um, you can find this information by looking at the database schema. Correct. That's this is the one I want. Submit answer. And then continue. Looks like it's right. Choice of type. You've learned that when a table is created, a data type must be indicated for each field. Choosing the correct data type allows the data be stored correctly and make certain operations associated with that data type available. For example, mathematical operations can be performed on numeric and integer data types but not bar chart data. Thus, it makes sense to store numeric values uh, such as numeric and integers so that you can perform math operations on them if needed. In this exercise, you'll practice selecting the proper data type for your data. A decimal, so that's going to be numeric. A model year such as 2004, those are whole numbers, so an integer um, weight in tons, so 6.7 goes back here because there's an int decimal places. Phone number such as 321 dash, 123. So I'm guessing Varjar because there's a dash in here and not just numbers stored, and we're not going to use numeric operations in a phone number, so let's put that here. Um, product reviews is text for sure. Uh, mail number of mailing list subscribers such as 97. So this is going to be an integer. Looks like that's our last item. Let's submit answers and see how we did. Looks like we got it right. It looks like that concludes uh, section one relational databases of the introduction to SQL course uh, presented by DataCamp. If you enjoyed following along on section one, please leave a like on the video and consider subscribing um, for section two. Thank you.